This is the Thursday, October 8, 2015 meeting of the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. Will you call the roll, please? Mr. Cars? Here. Mr. Ron? Here. Ms. Eicher? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Ms. Dole? Here. Ms. McKay? Here. Mr. Ayers? Here. Mr. Vig is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda are the minutes. Uh, if you've all noticed, based on the agenda, a little bit odd, there's some minutes from 2009, 2010, as well as uh, the minutes from 2015. Understanding there are a number of board members um, that weren't in attendance or weren't current board members that weren't on the board at the time, um, you can still vote on approval of the minutes, uh, all, all members here this evening. So there's no need to abstain from, um, from any voting on any of those minutes because you weren't on the board at that time. So with that in mind, um, does anyone have any uh, comments on the minutes? If not, could I have a motion to approve, please? Ms. McKay? So moved. Thank you. Could I have a second? Mr. Hart? Indicate you'd second that? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, are there any comments on the minutes? Are there any objection to approval? Seeing none, the minutes are approved. Uh, special order of business. Disclosures. Do we have any disclosures this evening? <clears throat> Mr. Ayers. Uh, Mr. Chair, in case number 2015-0091, I am acquainted with one of the petitioners in that case. And um, you've read through the uh, conflicts of interest uh, items. Do you feel that uh, you... Uh, meet any of those issue or items on the conflict of interest? Mr. Chair, no, I do not. And you feel you could be unbiased in your voting tonight? You feel you could be unbiased in your voting on the case this evening? Yes, Mr. Chair, I can remain unbiased in my vote tonight in the matter. Okay. So uh, I'd entertain a motion by one of the board members uh, to direct Mr. Ayers to participate. Yes, Ms. Eicher, thank you. Mr. Hart, you've seconded. Is there any objection to Mr. Ayers' participation? Thank you, Mr. Ayers, you've been uh, directed to participate in that case. Ms. Eicher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was not present at the July 9th, 2015 meeting, um, but I did get online and listen to the audio for resolution 2015-007 and will be able to vote on that today. Thank you, Ms. Eicher. Yes, Ms. McKay. Uh, same thing goes for me. I was not in attendance and I have listened to the, to the case. And we'll be able to vote. Thank you, Ms. McKay. Are there any other disclosures? Mr. Hart. I, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just realized this. I, I did attend the July 9th meeting, but I, I left the meeting before the case was um, presented, so I, I should probably um, abstain from this vote. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Are there any other disclosures? Next item is our consent agenda. Um, we have one resolution for approval on our consent agenda, resolution 2015-007. Um, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? 
Yes, Ms. Dole. You've indicated you. So moved. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McKay, you have seconded? Yes. Thank you. Would anyone like to pull any of the items from the consent agenda? Is there any uh, objection to approval of the consent agenda? Seeing none, consent agenda is approved. We have no appearance requests this evening. Uh, yes, Mr. Ron. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize. Perhaps I should have addressed this as a disclosure, but um, I've come less prepared than usual um, and don't have before me staff packets for case uh, 0075 and 0090. If I could um, get an extra set, that would be great. That's H1 and H2. That's correct. Thank you. And you have those copies now, Mr. Ron. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, staff. Uh, again, we have no appearance requests this evening. There's no unfinished business and actions of the public hearings. Uh, item G, regular agenda. We have no uh, items on the regular agenda. Uh, that brings us to our public hearings. Uh, before we hear our first case, I would like to read the order of business for variance hearings. The chair shall introduce the variance and explain the procedure to be followed. The variance case number and the name of the applicant shall be read into the record. The board shall hear and rule on any objections to the sufficiency of notice. The board shall hear a brief staff presentation outlining the variance, not to exceed 10 minutes. On conclusion of the staff presentation, the board members and the applicant may then direct questions to the staff through the chair. The applicant shall give his or her presentation, not to exceed 10 minutes. Throughout the proceedings, the burden of proof rests upon the applicant, who must convince the board by a preponderance of the evidence that the variance should be granted. On conclusion of the applicant's presentation, the board members and the staff may then direct questions to the applicant through the chair. The hearing shall then be open for public testimony. Each person has three minutes. Representatives of group have five minutes. All persons who testify may be questioned by the board, staff, or the applicant. On conclusion of the public testimony, the staff followed by the applicant shall have the right of rebuttal. The board shall proceed to develop oral findings and conclusions with regard to the variance and disposition of the variance. The staff shall reduce the oral findings and conclusions to writing for subsequent adoption by the board at a later meeting. The matter then rests with the board and the chair asks for a positive motion from the board. Uh, our first case, um, just w one other item there, uh, in order for a variance to pass, uh, it's required that there's a majority of the fully constituted board. So while there are seven members here this evening, the fully constituted board consists of nine members. So in order for a variance to pass, uh, five board members must vote in favor of that variance. So just for everyone's clarity, I wanted to bring that up. Our first case is 2015-075. The petitioner is Richard H. and Paula S. Brault. Is the petitioner here this evening? Uh, she's indicated she is present. Could staff provide us with the sufficiency of notice, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On August 19th, uh, 73 public hearing notices were mailed. As of this writing, I'm sorry, no, uh, no public comments were received and no uh, comments from the Bay Shore Clatt Community Council either. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Would you proceed with your presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this case was uh, scheduled, originally scheduled for uh, last month's meeting, but um, uh, 
there was uh, was going to be a bare quorum or a short board, and so the uh, the petitioner elected to uh, postpone uh, uh, to the following meeting, uh, which is tonight. Um, the petitioner is requesting a variance uh, from the R1 district regulations to allow a single-story garage to encroach 13 feet into the 20-foot primary front setback uh, along a cul-de-sac. Uh, the Building Safety Division issued a building permit uh, to the petitioner in 2003 for um, an addition um, to, uh, to the house and garage um, to make the garage uh, bigger. Um, the building permit was approved by the Building Safety Division in error because it included uh, an encroachment into that primary front yard setback. Uh, the petitioner is responsible for uh, this building permit issued in error. Um, uh, in, tr in regards to standard number one, uh, the standard uh, does not appear to be met. There are no exceptional physical circumstances of the land. The property is relatively flat. There are no streams or wetlands. The minimum lot area in the R1 district is 6,000 square feet, um, and this uh, lot has 8,200 um, square feet. The property is served by public water and sewer. Um, this is a corner lot with a primary front setback um, to the cul-de-sac and a secondary front setback to Via uh, Appia, uh, which is the street. Um, standard number two is uh, also does not appear to be met. Um, there are no physical circumstances of the land which prevent the owner from having a house in, on the property. The 13-foot front yard encroachment is due to the building addition that occurred um, in uh, uh, 2005. It appears that the building permit was approved by the Building Safety Division in error. No final certificate of occupancy uh, was issued and the, and the permit's never been closed. Standard number three um, uh, does appear to be substantially met. There are no um, uh, peculiarity of the lot. The lot is essentially the same as others in the neighborhood. Uh, the need for the variance is a uh, result of construction into the setback under an approved building permit. The as-built uh, is not drawn to scale and was approved by the Building Safety Division um, as a mistake. Um, standard number four um, also appears to be met. Um, the uh, variance will not adversely affect the use of adjacent property because uh, the encroachment is toward the cul-de-sac and not toward uh, a neighboring lot on either side. Um, fire engine access, site drainage are not issues with this property. The petitioner has provided uh, letters of non a letter of non-objection signed by the, um, by the property owners on four, uh, four different properties um, facing this um, encroachment. Um, and those uh, letters of, uh, or that letter of, of uh, a petition in support of granting the variance is on page 26 of your packet. Um, and then pages um, 27 through um, 30 are, uh, well, I guess those are some of the architectural drawings that were in the building permit file. Um, Standard number five is also met. Um, the request of variance is dimensional. It would not allow uh, prohibited use. The garage encro co encroaches 13 feet into the primary front setback, but does not, uh, the encroachment does not change the character of the, the R1 uh, zoning district. Standard number six is met. Uh, the encroachment will not cause a fire separation concern or violate a clear vision area. None of the reviewing agencies have objected to the variance request. The right-of-way division uh, provided comments stating that the driveway uh, was widened without a driveway permit and that removal of the chain link fence is uh, a requirement of um, the original um, 2003 building permit. Uh, the driveway should be narrowed so that it, um, it is not paved all the way to the corner in the intersection. Um, and uh, um, of course the building permit uh, should be closed out and that will handle the issue of the encroaching fence which the, I think the applicant intends to remove in accordance with that building permit. Um, standard number seven it does not appear to be met. The existing garage encroaches 65 percent into the primary front setback um, facing the cul-de-sac. The variance is not needed for the property owner to make reasonable use of the land. Uh, prior to the garage expansion under this approved building permit, there was a house with a single car garage on the lot, which met the minimum setbacks. Um, 
the department um, must uh, recommend um, a denial of the variance because uh, standards one, two, and seven are not substantially met. If after uh, public hearing, um, the board finds that all seven standards are substantially met. The department's recommending um, that uh, the approval be conditioned on, um, there should be three conditions of approval which are on pages uh, five and six. Um, the first two, um, one and two, are standard. The third one is to remove uh, the portion of the driveway between um, the, uh, the cul-de-sac and uh, the edge of the building um, to narrow the, the driveway. Um, I, that's all I have, and uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Paula Brandt, the petitioner, is uh, here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Are there any questions of, of staff? Yes, Ms. Dole. Uh, yes, I understand that the, um, there are two, that the setback for the side is 20 feet. Um, this is a corner lot, and so there's two front setbacks. Mm -hmm. I would I guess I'd like to understand is the reason for that requirement when you have a corner lot that you have two front setbacks, the purpose of it? Um, th th thank you, uh, Ms. Stoll, uh, through the chair. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer the purpose of why the property has, um, you know, uh, two encumbering uh, uh, front setbacks. Um, uh, I can tell you that that the, um, the primary front setback is based on uh, the uh, prevailing uh, lot pattern. And in this case, um, the narrow part of the lot faces the cul-de-sac. So it's clearly the primary front setback, even though the house, um, uh, its front door faces via Appia, which is the road there. Um, and then, uh, uh, so the, the code is clear. It's based on the prevailing lot pattern. So when me as a planner um, looks at, you know, an as-built, um, uh, this one is, is very clearly a primary front setback, 20-foot setback um, to uh, uh, the cul-de-sac. Um, secondary front setback is what the code specifies for the other uh, front yard. Um, on a corner lot, and that's a lot the, facing the street via Appia. And then um, there's no rear yard, just two uh, side yards, um, and that's on the back side and the side of the house. Um, I, I would surmise that um, the, the purpose of um, having uh, um, larger front setbacks than uh, side and rear setbacks are um, to uh, have a consistency on how um, a house uh, en engages uh, the, the public realm, the street, um, and that, um, you know, all of the, the lots be held to the, the, same, um, the same standard um, in order to protect property values. Um, I think that um, the, you know, one could say that the purpose of having a larger front setback is um, to uh, maybe give the lot some privacy, um, or maybe it's to allow for emergency services to make wild turnarounds without, I think it's probably um, has something to do with um, urban design and um, uh, not making um, sort of the, the roadway seem uh, narrow, uh, pushing houses all the way to the front and then allowing them to have um, generous backyards um, uh, those are just sort of a speculation on, on, on where, how zoning codes developed um, these. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Mr. Ron. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, Mr. McLaughlin, um, can you inform me about the determination of um, front versus, or excuse me, primary versus secondary front yard setback um, and whether or not there's any opportunity to revisit the assignment for um, one parcel on a parcel by parcel basis. Um, uh, through the chair, Mr. Ron, um, I could read to you the section of the code, but I just have um, a phrase from it 
um, committed to memory, which is um, that it's based on the prevailing lot pattern. And um, so that is to say that, so this is confusing to the public, right? Well, you know, what is the front yard? Um, because it could be either one. Their, their, the front door of their house faces via Appia. And if you ask the applicant, they would say, um, my driveway, my front door, my front yard, all of my uh, windows in my living room, everything about the house faces uh, 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 via Appia. Um, in fact, my mailbox is on via Appia. Um, and it would take a, sort of a, a planner to say, no, 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 the, the zoning code um, would, would say that it's not based on any of those things, but um, on um, how the, um, the, the lots are subdivided so that the, um, the narrow part of the lot is um, the, the direction of that. Um, and uh, so, so in this case, the, the long side uh, of the rectangle is along the Appia, so that would only be a secondary front setback. Um, you know, in some corner lots, um, it's hard to tell um, which um, which is the front yard, and um, in those cases, um, staff tries to uh, give the benefit of the doubt to the property owner. Uh, but in this one, um, one side is is clearly longer than the other, so. Um, uh, you know, uh, the determination's been made that, um, you know, per planning's review, the, the primary front yard is facing the cul-de-sac. And if I could follow up uh, with the second part of my question in terms of opportunity for um, revisiting that, that decision on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis, is, is, is that a potential remedy? Um, uh, so uh, staff is bound by this determination, but I think that the um, that the board um, could um, disagree with staff and find that um, I guess you know a 70 foot wide front yard facing um, via uh, um, facing the cul-de-sac and um, sort of this oddly trapezoidal shaped lot um, 80 foot. Uh, uh, 80 foot long um, front yard facing via Appia, um, one could, um, uh, you know, determine that um, it makes more sense uh, uh, as a practical circumstance that that the uh, that via Appia be the primary front yard, and in this case, it it meets um, it exceeds the required setback. And and as a board, um, I. We've had this similar discussion in the past. We cannot change the that determination on what it is. That's the um, the staff's responsibility. But that did come into play in the findings of fact um, and justifications for certain standards being met. I know we we spent quite a bit of time on this on a couple of cases um, in the past. Thanks. Ms. Iker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if staff could speak really briefly to the process for the building permit. I'm looking at staff packet page 10, and I was noticing that there's a lot of hand-drawn written notations, and I was wondering if um, perhaps there was the mistaken belief. I think I was going along a similar line of reasoning as Mr. Ron, but perhaps a little bit different. Was there the mistaken belief that the primary setback was on via Appia Way? Is that what the 20-foot notation was? Um, I guess I was wondering, my first question is, who made the handwritten um, notations, and were they approved by the building permit um, person, perhaps under, I mean, was everybody looking at this perhaps differently as far as where the primary and secondary front yard setbacks were? Um, through the chair, uh, Ms. Iker, um, so uh, page 10 is um, lifted from the actual building permit. I, I hand wrote on the top, building permit 2003. Um, the, uh, this was submitted for um, the building permit uh, zoning plan reviews, then we, what we call the office, that will look at these setbacks before they approve the building permit. And um, uh, Deb Agler, who is now retired, um, uh, 
she, uh, when she was working there, her signature is in the upper left-hand corner. So that says, uh, you know, zoning plan review has approved this addition. So zoning review did look at this, um, but everything that's written on here, um, I believe, um, is from the, other than that signature from Deb Agler, is uh, from the, uh, um, either the architect or the, the homeowner um, writing on um, probably their original as-built that came with their property when they bought the house, you know, 20 years before or something, right? Um, uh, I guess my my guess, and it's, it's just purely speculation, is that um, that the uh, the architect um, didn't know the the zoning setback requirements um, and um, drew it thinking that the primary front yard was the logical one, which was the front door of the house. Um, I don't think that Deb Agler would have made that error. I think that she would have looked at this. This is just speculation. I think that the Zoning plan review would have looked at this and uh, seen that um, it, they they just would have seen that the um, the building addition was going to match the line of the existing house, which is 20 feet away from the front yard. Um, the house was built as close to the front yard as, as you can push it um, within a you know fraction of an inch, and I think that they just continued that line. Um, so uh, you know it's it's hard to guess what happened then. But, but the, is, I think the handwriting on here is not from zoning plan review, but from either the property owner or um, the architect. And um, the applicant might be able to, um, Paula might be able to uh, speak to uh, um, who she thinks uh, wrote on this, if it was, if it was her husband or, or uh, an architect at the time. Thank you. Ms. McKay. To the chair, um, Mr. McLaughlin, even if even if we decided um, or wanted to use the uh, secondary front yard, it's ha um, you know switch them around. The secondary front yard is is half of the primary, isn't that true? Mm -hmm. And it would still encroach if we're looking at the as built on page nine. It says that the corner is seven feet away from that. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, I have uh, two questions. One, um, is standard number three, um, the, it says the standard is substantially met. Then as I read through the um, the the narrative below that it lends itself to seeing that the staff's position is that that standard is not met. Just wanted to clarify, um, am I misunder misunderstanding? Um, the right up there, right um, through the chair, um, Mr. Cars. Uh, staff finds that this standard is uh, substantially met, um, not fully met, and not partially met. Substantially met. Um, that's based on, um, you know, the uh, the building permit was um, approved or or issued in in error, and that's a, a hardship that was not self-imposed um, by uh, uh, you know on the property owner uh, upon um, themselves. Um, that's where um, our finding is that it the standard is substantially met. Thank you. And then my, my second question, do we know what the, uh, the right of way width is for the, um, and I'm not even sure what this cul-de-sac or this cul-de-sac bulb is called, or if it's just a part of via Appia, but the, um, the second uh, right of way that, that's not via Appia <laughs> on page nine. Um, Via Appia is a 60 foot of dedicated right of way um, and uh, the cul-de-sac, um, it's a really big cul-de-sac. Uh, I think it's bigger than 50 feet uh, radius cul-de-sac. Um, it may be uh, 50 feet, that would be the, the minimum. It, it's, uh, I don't know if you can tell from the photos on 
page 12, but it's, uh, it looks like a really large, um, you know, sort of dead space. It's, it's much larger than my cul-de-sac, <laughs> the one uh, at my home. Um, yeah, so 60 feet of dedicated right-of-way for Via Appia and the cul-de-sac um, would be a minimum of 50. I, it, it looked more likely, having stood there, a uh, 60-foot radius um, uh, cul-de-sac. It, it's, uh, yeah, so 60 foot of right-of-way, um, you know, streets are usually only 24 feet of pavement within that 60 feet, you know, maybe on the street center line. So the reason why we have such wide right-of-way dedications is for snow storage and if um, um, pedestrian amenities, um, you know, street lighting and things um, are to uh, be built, uh, curb and gutter, this, this, uh, this neighborhood has a rolled curb, um, but uh, 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 an urban standard street can be easily built within 60 feet right away. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Mr. Ron. Thank you, through the chair, Mr. McLaughlin. I should probably dig through the pack a little more thoroughly before asking the question, but was wondering um, if you could speak to staff uh, condition number three on page six of the staff packet um, around removal of the portion of the driveway between the south edge of the building and the cul-de-sac. Um, is the driveway width measurement uh, only that portion of the asphalt driveway extending, let's say, from the corner of the house out to via Appia? Um, just trying to get my head wrapped around, is, is that the right and only remedy um, to, to address the, the issue of the driveway width being, being too wide? Um, the, the width of the driveway is a whole sort of complicated issue, um, but uh, to make it very simple, um, there was just a little narrow uh, driveway previously, and um, the uh, property owner intended to uh, uh, just pave, um, uh, widen the driveway um, with uh, out to the street um, in front of the um, the new garage doors that were added, but the uh, the paver um, got a little uh, over, did more than the, the property owner wanted, and paved all the way to the cul-de-sac, which is totally unacceptable because you can't have a paved corner like that. It, it, it's a public safety issue to have people driving out from sort of odd angles. Um, so, uh, in discussions with the property owner, um, they, uh, they've expressed to me verbally that they, um, and you can confirm that with her, uh, that they want to cut it back um, and meet this uh, condition of approval. They're fine with this condition of approval. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't know if I should get into the details about the width of the driveway and how much frontage you have, because it, it, it just would be, it would be really weird to um, uh, shrink the width of the driveway uh, to be narrower than garage doors in front of it. I don't know that the neighbors would like to see some sort of odd situation where you'd have grass in front of driveway. That's not a, an appealing thing to have. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Yes, Ms. Dole. Um, through the chair, a, a quick question. Um, I would just like to make sure I understand. Um, I know that at one at its widest, if that's the right term to use in this case, that the um, the garage encroaches 13 feet into this 20 foot setback, but <coughs> it's at a slant. And I guess I'd just like to know. Um, at its narrowest, what that um, setback is. So, what what is how much of a slant is it? Um. <coughs> um, through the chair, Ms. Dole, um, this um, this as built from uh, June from from this summer. Um, uh, staff requests, um, and this is based on direction given to us by the the board, um, the zoning board of examiners and appeals that. Um, that you want to see um, a uh, surveyed uh, dimension and label, um, uh, you know, dimensioning the, the maximum point of, uh, the dimensioning the, the, the variance. 
and um, because it's at this type of, uh, it's not uh, uh, parallel lines, um, we often phrase the, um, the, uh, the condition of approval that at the maximum point of encroachment based on the as-built provided with the application because um, we, we haven't gone back and asked them to provide a dimension for each corner. They just dimensioned one. Um, and that's, you know, because probably staff didn't ask them to go back and dimension both corners. And I just don't know that it, because this is a, I didn't bring my scale and the original as built in the file, but it's, it's, we shrink it to fit here. So it's not really, uh, it's not, I mean, it's to scale, but not to a scale that's measurable. Thank you. No further questions. Are there any, any other questions? Seeing none, could the applicant come forward, please? And could you uh, state and spell your name for the record, please? Yes, my name is Paula Brault. It's Paula, P-A-U-L-A, -A, last name Brault, B as in boy, R-A-U-L-T. Thank you, Ms. Brault. Uh, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. And again, we must find that all standards are met in order to grant the variance. So if at a minimum you can uh, make sure that you address the standards, please. Okay. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. I want to thank you very much for being here and taking the time to hear my request for this variance. My husband, uh, Richard, and I own the home which we're discussing. Um, I also wanted to thank you, Mr. McLaughlin, for all your help in getting us here tonight. Um, as you know, the reason that we are here tonight is that my husband applied for a permit in 2003 to build a garage. We submitted the required documents and paid the inspection and review fees and the Municipal Building Safety Division issued an approved permit. And based on that permit, we built the garage. It did take us several years to complete because we were paying for it out of pocket. Um, as we were getting our final inspections over this last year, um, that's when we found out that the building permit that was reviewed and approved in 03 was issued in error. The expert municipal employee responsible for knowing property setbacks missed the fact that this was a cul-de-sac with a 20-foot setback on the side of the house. Just like we saw it, she probably saw it too. Um, you were talking earlier about the um, permit that was issued and who may have written on it. And I have the original here, and it appears that the writing is from Gretchen Stuller. Um, it just matches the pen and it matches the, the writing that's on there. It says submittal May 23rd and then it's got her, her stamp. So I think she's the one who drew the information about removing the fence and the arrows. Um, we've lived in this home for over 15 years and it means a lot to us. Building this garage was a major endeavor and it's absolutely beautiful now that it's almost done. I'm asking that you approve this variance so that we do not have to demolish a portion of our home. I read through the municipal staff's report and my husband and I are willing to accept the staff's conditions of approval should you choose to approve this variance. I quite honestly had forgotten about the fence in the front yard. There was more of it there and par a part of it is already gone and we were planning on removing it. Um, so we will be removing that. Um, and we did the driveway, we, we repaved it in June. Um, we had the paver come in and we asked them at the time if we needed a permit. Of course, we relied on them and they said, no, we didn't. So we do agree to removing that portion of the fence and the driveway that we need to remove. Um, in regards to staff's comments about the standards that have to be met to allow for the approval of a variance, I agree with their decision that standards three, four, five, and six are substantially met. However, I must disagree with their decision on standards one, two, and seven. Standard one says there exist exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances of the subject property, such as, but not limited to streams, wetlands, or slope, and such physical circumstances are not applicable to other land in the same district. I want you to note the in quotes, or what I call in quotes, but not limited to when it speaks to stream, wetlands, and slopes. Our extraordinary, extraordinary physical circumstances 
is the very boundary distances of the lot lines. Our lot is an irregular sized rounded rectangle with the front of the house facing east towards Via Appia, not facing the cul-de-sac. The, yes. Could, could you speak into your mi the microphone, oh, please? We need right. to record this. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay, let me back up. The length of the front lot line along Via Appia Road is 80 feet, while the rear is 116 feet. The north lot line is 86 feet long, and the south lot line is 50 feet with a radius. The other peculiarity is that it is a corner lot on a cul-de-sac, and the primary front setback is on the cul-de-sac, which is the side of the garage. These, I feel, are the extraordinary physical circumstances that meet standard one. Standard two reads, because of these physical circumstances, the strict application of this code would create an exceptional or undue hardship upon the property owner. I won't read the rest of it. A building permit was issued by the municipality. The garage was built as approved on the plan, and to require removal of the garage would create an exceptional hardship. Removal of the garage would be a great expense. Therefore, I believe standard two has been substantially met. Standard seven says the variance granted is the minimum variance that will make possible a reasonable use of the land. The variance is needed for us to make reasonable use of the land as improved. It would be unreasonable to require us to demolish the garage at great expense when this variance could be granted. Thank you again for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Brault. Are there, are there any questions of the applicant by the board? I do have a, excuse me, Ms. Brault, I do have a, a question. Um, the architectural plans that were part of the building permit, um, you and your husband had those uh, drawn up? Yes. Do you recall what just ballpark, um, well, regard, regardless of the cost, you, you incurred uh, some expense to have those drafted up, yes. I'm assuming? I'm, I'm guessing somewhere in the range of eleven to $1,500 just for that piece of it. It was Blind Monkey, I believe, Blind Monkey Design. I don't know if her name is on here. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions of the petitioner? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did staff have any questions of the petitioner? I'm sorry. Um, no questions of the petitioner. Um, okay. May I make a, a, a comment? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, a while back, there was a, um, um, a request from the, the board for a, um, uh, a legal determination on some of the standards in the latest court cases. And um, one of the uh, paragraphs in um, the legal department's response was, it says, um, quote, oftentimes the unique physical circumstance is the shape of the lot or its dimensions. Other times, the lot has unique uh, topographical features like steep slopes. Another possible situation uh, that arises in uh, Anchorage cases is when uh, an applicant uh, claims that the existing building on the lot is the unique f physical circumstance creating the hardship. Some courts have found that the existing structures on the lot may qualify as unique physical circumstances. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. With that, um, I will open the hearing for public testimony. Is there anyone from the public wishing to testify in this case? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, the public hearing is closed. Does staff have any rebuttal? No, sir. Uh, Ms. Brault, do, do you have any rebuttal? Okay, um, with that, the matter rests with the board.
Could I have a positive motion from a board member, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in case number 2015-0075, I move that the board grant a variance from AMC 21.40.030 G1 minimum yard requirements to allow an existing single-story garage to encroach 13 feet into the 20-foot primary front setback uh, in consideration or including uh, staff conditions, department recommendations, excuse me, numbers one through three on pages five and six of the staff packet. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Could I have a second to his motion, please? Yes, Ms. McKay, you've indicated you'd second that? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Ron, would you speak to your motion, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do intend to support my motion. I appreciate um, staff's uh, recent comments regarding the legal guidance that was requested and has been received. Um, with respect to standard number one, uh, I find that this standard is met uh, with respect to the placement of the house originally on the structure, or excuse me, on the parcel as dictating um, the location of the garage as it was constructed. Um, in addition to that, um, the added complication of the approved permit, while it's not a, a physical circumstance, it definitely is an element that weighs um, heavily in my review of, of other standards. Uh, standard two, um, uh, carrying forward the physical circumstance related to the placement of the lot um, in relation to, excuse me, the placement of the house in relation to the lot dimensions, um, I find that the standard is met and in fact, um, strict application uh, would create an exceptional or undue hardship upon the property owner. Uh, we've, we've heard from the petitioner the cost that went into the plans, um, which I, I think is a small drop in the bucket compared to uh, the hard effort and, and out-of-pocket costs that went into the construction of the, the garage itself. Uh, which uh, appears to um, be congruent with the house and um, have uh, what I consider to be nice uh, street appeal. Uh, with respect to standard number three, I concur with staff that it is in fact substantially met for the reasons as discussed during the public hearing. I concur with uh, staff on standards four through six that the standard is met. Standard seven, um, I find that the standard is at least partially met if, if not completely met. Um, the petitioner came to the department with a request to expand a garage. That request was reviewed and, and approved. Um, as such, there was an understanding of the use of that permit as it was reviewed and issued and believe that the um, petitioner has um, uh, completed their end of the bargain, let's say, with respect to the intended use of, of the land uh, for that garage. Um, with that, I'll conclude my discussion, but look forward to other board member comments on my motion. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Ms. McKay. Thank you. I, uh, I intend to support the motion as well um, and do appreciate uh, Mr. McLaughlin's statements uh, at the end that the, the petition, the position of the house does, um, is unique. Um, and I also find that the, the width of the cul-de-sac on the offending side um, is a, a mitigating circumstance, um, 100 feet through there. Um, and also uh, testimony from staff that there isn't any um, clear vision 
issue uh, with the position of the of the garage and um, concur with mr. Ron about uh, the findings on on the on the seven and I will support the motion thank you ms. McKay are there any other comments from board members I also intend to support the motion. I, I agree with the findings of staff, Mr. Ron and Ms. McKay, and I'm I'm also uh, comfortable, and do feel that the the driveway width is excessive, and removing standard number three addresses my concern, as far as um, removing that that portion of the um, the driveway from the south edge of the building. Um, with that, please vote. That motion passes by vote of seven to zero. I do need to read for the record, every final decision of the board shall clearly state on its face it is the final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the Superior Court. Our next case this evening is case 2015-0090. Uh, the petitioner, Kathy and Drew Grimes, Susan Starr and Dave Zabo and Doris Falconer are the owners. And I, uh, the petitioner and the petitioner's representatives here this evening is, thank you. And I believe we have uh, a letter um, from the applicants that Mr. Tim Potter would be representing them this evening. Um, Mr. Whitfield, this is your case. Yes. C could you provide us with a sufficiency of notice, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on September 17th, 108 public hearing notices were mailed. One response was received from the public. Uh, no comments were received from the South Edition Community Council, and one comment was received from one of the petitioners. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Would you proceed with your presentation? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this summer, the Bootlegger Park Condominium Association initiated a uh, building permit process to uh, replace the, the decks of each one of their eight duplexes uh, due to leakage and rot. The design of the new decks would allow for each unit enough space to place a small table and two chairs. During that process, uh, it was determined that three of the units required variances. Uh, unit one uh, required a 5.9, or uh, encroached 5.9 feet into the required front yard setback. Uh, unit 11, um, encroached 3.3 feet in the required front yard setback and unit 2 encroached 5 feet into the required side yard setback. Um, I'll go through each one of the, the seven standards separately. Standard number one, um, staff believes that uh, this standard does not appear to be met for all three variances. There are, no, there are no exceptional physical circumstances of the property that would warrant the granting of this variance. The lot is not affected by slopes, streams, or wetlands. The lot is served by public water and sewer. Uh, it's similar in size to other lots in the neighborhood. And while there appears to be no physical circumstances of the subject property, um, both lots do have conditions that limit the developable footprint of the property. Um, specifically, lot one, uh, while in similar in size to other lots in the area, is oddly shaped a uh, triangular lot that severely limits where a deck could be uh, constructed. Lot 6, again, while similar in size to other lots in the area, is unique in that it is encumbered by a large 30-foot-wide uh, sewer easement um, in the rear. This required the building to be pushed uh, to the front of the lot and set back only 20 feet from the front property line, which does not allow for a, uh, a deck 
second story deck to be put on the, the, the front of the uh, structure. Standard number two, staff uh, believes that this standard does not appear to be met for all three variances. There are no physical circumstances of the land contributing to the need for these variances. Uh, the petitioner is not deprived the rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same zoning district. Standard number three, this standard appears to be partially met for all three variances. Um, there are, there is no natural or physical peculiarity of the subject lots. Uh, lot one is uniquely shaped and lot six is encumbered by a rather large easement, but the shape of the lot and easement do not constitute a physical uh, peculiarity. The need for these variances is due to the Homeowners Association's board's decision to replace the existing decks for all uh, 16 units after a history of leakage and rot. Individual condo, condo association owners are financially bound to the board's decision and have paid a $13,500 assessment per unit. Um, standard number four, this standard appears to be met for all three variances. Given the character of the neighborhood, it does not appear as though the granting of this variance will have an adverse effect on adjacent property. Standard five, the standard appears to be met for all three variances. Requested variances for front and side, uh, side yard setback encroachments will not change the character of the R2D uh, zoning district. Standard number six, uh, this standard appears to be met for all three variances. No adverse effects are anticipated if all three variances were approved. The dwelling units are part of a condo association with the side setback encroachment for unit two having no negative impact on neighboring units. Furthermore, the front yard setback encroachments for unit one and 11 do not appear to obstruct pedestrian or vehicular traffic. Standard seven, staff finds that uh, this standard appears to be partially met for all three variances. One may argue that the size of the decks could be reduced to lessen the encroachment into the respective setbacks. However, these units are part of the condo association and are financially bound to this project regardless of whether or not these variances are approved. The requested variances would allow the petitioners to construct the decks um, that have parity with the other decks in this development. Um, so with uh, that being said, uh, Staff finds that uh, standards one, two, three, and seven are not substantially met and therefore must recommend denial of this variance. Um, if the board finds that all seven standards are substantially met, then the approval should be um, subject to the condition list, conditions listed on pages, uh, page six of your staff packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Are there any questions of staff? questions seeing none could the applicant come forward please could you state and spell your name for the record my name is Tim Potter with Dow engineers first name TIM last name P is in Paul O T T E R thank you mr. Potter and um, you're representing the applicants this evening? Yes, I am. And they are also in the audience, and uh, so are uh, a number of the uh, condominium owners. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, just just note for you and the applicants that as uh, you have 10 minutes for the presentation. Um, so if, uh, if any of the applicants intend to speak as well, that would need to be part of the 10 minutes. I think we'll uh, all use the 10 minutes, and if you have specific questions um, that can be best answered by uh, the applicants or an architect that actually uh, put some information into my package, uh, who is also a resident there, uh, we'd, we'd expect that to just be answering questions. So. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Would you proceed with your presentation? Sure. Let me uh, first hand out four pictures, two of which uh, show the existing um, decks at um, units one and two showing the existing and old design um, that really shows where the problem is 
And then I've got two pictures that um, then also, here David, show the, uh, my truck, which is a extended cab pickup truck in the driveway of unit number one with pictures from the east looking west along 15th Avenue. So you can get an idea of what any impact might be from the new decks that would encroach uh, into the front yard setbacks. So with that, I did hand out um, a very short and uh, very concise, I hope, um, outline of the seven um, prerequisite requirements and um, my answers to those indicating that I believe that they have all been met. I have also included a letter from Jim Blair, an architect who lives in the facility. When I pushed the copy button on the copy machine, I inadvertently did not get his signature on the second page, but effectively all of the content of his letter is here. He is also in the audience if you have any specific questions. Important in that letter is to learn from the history uh, that he discusses concerning the problems that the condominium association has had um, really since day one um, with the bathtub-like um, decks and the problems that they've had, the repairs that they've done over the years, the current repair that they're doing, and a lawsuit associated with a plumber who was working at one of the units that um, slipped, fell, and sued the Homeowners Association for $250,000 and won um, based on the ice buildup where the scupper, if you know what a scupper is, drains onto the driveway and entryway to the house. So the pictures that I, I handed out that show the two existing one and two units um, show that a scupper is an outlet, actually a hole through the wall of the building or a parapet. Uh, in this case, it would be a railing wall, a solid wall. Um, that is supposed to release water from that surface out. Um, number one, it didn't necessarily prove operable. Number two, when it did drain, especially during the winter, everything drained right onto the very important corner of the garage, which is where everybody going to the front door has to pass. And, and thus that was um, at least probably best pronounced as far as evidence is the $250,000 settlement um, on the slip and fall. So in attempting to correct the situation, the Homeowners Association um, has replaced uh, 13 of the 16 decks um, and there are pictures in your packet of those. Um, the idea being to give some partial cover to the corner of the building, to the front walkway, uh, eliminate the scupper and allow the drainage from that deck area to be distributed uh, so that it can be, and get it to the point where it can be easily managed by their um, uh, snow and ice removal um, contractor, which has reviewed the plans and indicated that they could satisfactorily um, deal with the issue once the decks were fully placed. This development was originally built in the 1970s, in the mid 70s originally envisioned as a plan unit development to be all on one parcel. That changed and they basically platted the property into a number of lots with each having a duplex condominium on each lot. It is all of the lots are governed by the homeowners association. And I indicate this because when you look at unit number two that needs the side lot line uh, um, encroachment for the variance, if this were in fact built as a typical condominium project all on one lot, um, you would not need that variance. Um, the building safety department would look at the building separation for fire code and that would be the issue at that point. So I really believe that that one's not an issue and um, that the test for that has been met. It's very important when you're going through um, these conditions and prerequisite requirements that we meet all of them. Something that the staff was not aware of and something that um, the applicants themselves were not aware of is that in 1997, this body, not you, but previous members of this body, approved a variance for a very similar situation three lots away from this. Their findings included that the prevailing weather patterns with no protect protection from the south and southeast um, coming across Westchester Lagoon 
was a um, unusual and uh, physical circumstance that was not um, borne by all the lots in, in the city or in this district. With no protection from your next door neighbor, their trees or their building, these units facing to the south and southeast take the full brunt of our prevailing wet weather um, patterns. Um, since that finding was put in place, I believe that that proves in fact that our uh, contention that the physical hardship and circumstance peculiar to this property is a prevailing pattern of weather in the area that creates a safety concern uh, in combination with the previous design um, holds up and has been proven. That would hold for um, condition number two or prerequisite requirement number two. Obviously number three, the applicants can't control the weather. I certainly wish they could, but they can't. Uh, I believe the others are fairly straightforward. Number seven was the last of the issues that the staff had indicated um, was only partially met or had not been met. And the decks that have been put in place are effectively 22 square feet larger than the existing decks, the bathtubs that were on the buildings originally. 22 feet is about two feet by eight and a half feet um, or so. So it's a very nominal difference. But what it does do is that it gets the drainage out away from the garage door about four feet, allows a dry zone under the deck and at the corner going to the front door of um, each of the units, which is very important because safety is the issue. As far as hardship goes, um, the replacement costs, five of the units were structurally um, compromised by the rot that occurred and the need to replace the glue lamb beams, which actually support the front of the buildings. Um, with that in mind, um, there truly are consequences from a safety standpoint, both from a structural standpoint and the slip and fall issue created by the weather conditions uh, and the original design that had been there. We believe this is the minimum uh, improvement and encroachment that could be done. Lastly, and I wasn't necessarily trying to be cute, but I added a number eight, which uh, with my white hair shared with uh, Mr. Ayers, that really the test when you're looking at the reality and the real test of whether a variance um, is going to have an impact on the area or not is to do the common person test. Would you or any other common person walking down 15th Avenue or driving down 15th Avenue from either direction, would the deck strike them as something that was unusual, encroaching out into the public realm or anything else? And, and I can swear, and that's why I put the last two pictures in there, that in fact, not only do the existing units look funny now, and those are the things that stick out, but you will not, I will not, I could not, if I didn't know what the dimensions were, be able to pick out and identify this property as having three decks that encroach into the front yard or side yard setbacks. With that, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. The actual resolution number of the uh, Ziba action in 97 was 97-046, and that was for a property around the corner three lots, uh, the owner of that house uh, being the Gooch House, actually a former member of the Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Are there any questions of the board of Mr. Potter? Yes, Mr. Ron. Thank you, through the chair. Mr. Potter, can we re revisit the um, difference in dimensions from the new decks versus the prior? Um, you handed the board uh, a packet and uh, a letter from, well, the, the header is from, from GDM Inc. indicates the new decks are a modest 52 square foot increase over the previous decks, 28 square feet. Um, and then also looking at the drawings on page 21 of the staff packet, um, I'm having trouble coming up with the number of 12 square feet as a difference. I'm gonna look at the architect. I asked him to clarify and confirm the numbers. So. And it, it may be as little as 12. The, the increase is 
If, excuse me, sir. You're going to need to come up and um, speak into the microphone so we can record your testimony. And if you would first state and spell your name for the record. I'm Jim Blair, J-I-M-B-L-A-I-R. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Did you understand the question? Yes. The correct increase in square footage is 52 square feet. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of the applicant? Yes, Ms. Dole. Uh, well, first through the chair, the increase is 52 square feet or the, um, or the total is, uh, or the? I believe that the square footage total of the new decks is 52 square feet. You'd subtract the previous or current decks on those three units away from that, and I believe the delta is 22 square feet. I guess I didn't, I didn't make that clear in my letter, which, uh, yeah. So the existing decks are 28 square feet and the increase is 52. Mr. Blair, could I ask it another way? What are the si what's the size of the new deck? Is this is it 52 or is it 52 plus 28? It's 52 plus 28. It's the size of the new decks. Okay. Apologize for the error. Um, Ms. Dole, did you have another question? Uh, yeah. Yes. There's a number of photos, and I just was looking for one if you could that shows the new decks that have already been built for the other units that are not encroaching. Could you just point me to the right one so I'm looking at the right one? Could you repeat that and speak a little bit closer into the microphone, please? Uh, yes, I, I understood that the decks have already been built for the other units where no variance is being requested. Yes. And I just wanted um, you to point me to a picture that showed those already built ones as opposed to the ones that just show the diagrams. That there are some pictures in the staff packet. Um, if you, let's see, if you look on the second page of pictures, you will see the decks without the railings um, in place. And you can see a side by side, so attachment nine in this location shows the deck base and floor that has been built uh, with a two by four across the door so no one, no one would exit the door. And then adjacent to it, the, the existing current deck of a unit waiting for the variance to be approved. Are there any other questions of the applicant? Does staff have any questions of the applicant? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Potter. We will then open this up for public testimony. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to testify? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing no one, the public hearing is closed. Does staff have any rebuttal? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Potter? Not necessarily rebuttal, just a comment that there are supportive documents and letters uh, and signatures from adjacent property owners uh, indicating their non-objection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Potter. With that, uh, the matter rests with the board. Could, could I have a positive motion from a board member, please?
I'm sorry, <laughs> Ms. Eicher. I, I did not see that. You, you make the motion? I do. Yes. Um, I make a motion with <laughs> respect to case 2015-0090 to approve a variance. Do I need to go through all, do I read through all this now? Excuse, I'm okay. sorry. To approve a variance from AMC 21.40.040 G1, the minimum yard requirements to allow a second story cantilever deck to encroach 9.5 feet into the front yard setback for unit one. Um, a variance from AMC 21.40.040 G1, a minimum yard requirements to allow a second story cantilever deck to encroach 3.3 feet into the front yard setback unit 11 and a variance from AMC 21.040.040 G2 minimum yard setback to allow a second story cantilever deck to encroach five feet into the side yard setback with respect to unit two. Subject to staff's recommendations one um, two and three in the staff packet. Thank you, Ms. Eicher. Um, Mr. Ayers, you indicated you would second that? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Ms. Eicher, would you speak to your motion, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to standard number one, that there exists exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances in which the subject property um, has I find the um, testimony of the applicant uh, persuasive um, on two fronts. First, the situation of the lots in relation to the lagoon and the weather patterns that were um, discussed and the effect that it has on the buildings and the property itself. I find that to be exceptional and extraordinary physical circumstance of the of the parcels themselves. And secondarily, uh, the situation of the condos on those lots, um, the, as noted in both the staff's testimony and the applicant's testimony, um, the first um, lot is an odd triangular shape causing the structure to be situated, or quite snugly fitted on the lot um, so as not to encroach in the two easement areas any more so than necessary. And similarly, lot number five, um, I'm sorry, six, has the 30-foot sewer easement in the back pushing the structure up to the front of the lot. So with those two exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances of the lot, I find myself um, with standard number two, persuaded by the fact that strict application of the code would create undue hardship by the fact, or by simply looking at the past record expenses that the HOA has incurred in trying to um, maintain the existing decks as they were designed. It appears that um, the design of the decks was not conducive to suit their intended purposes given the weather patterns and given the physical constraints of the property and therefore um, standard number three would also be met in my mind that the hardship is not self-imposed. Standard number, I agree with staff's recommendations on standards four, five, and six. Um, I find that standard number seven is also met um, perhaps what's most persuasive in my mind with regards to use of a deck which would be a fairly common enjoyment with um, neighboring parcels is the photo that was provided on page, pardon me. And 
any event, there was a photo that was provided of the existing deck with one chair on it. And the testimony that was provided that the new decks would allow for a small table and four chairs. And so um, in keeping in mind that the new design allows for safety of ingress and egress, use of a deck, and structural integrity to the, um, the deck in the home, I find that standard number seven is substantially met. Thank you, Ms. Eicher. Uh, Mr. Ayers? Mr. Chair, I also find that the conditions have been met uh, for much the same reasons as Ms. Eicher. Um, Could you speak more clearly into your microphone, Mr. Ayers? Thank you. I also find that the conditions have been met uh, for substantially the same reasons as noted by Ms. Eicher, and uh, in particular, the safe use of the buildings uh, weighed heavily in my decision to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Ayers. Are there any other comments from board members? Yes, Mr. Ron. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair um, and Ms. Eicher. I may have misheard, but when the motion was put before the board, um, I heard um, 9.5 feet rather than 5.9 feet. I just would request Ms. Eicher entertain an administrative clarification on that to make sure that the record is correct and that the intention was 5.9 feet. It was. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair and, and, and to the board, I, I'm struggling a little bit with, um, with the motion. I appreciate uh, Board Member Eicher's and Ayer's comments. Um, but, but I'm stuck on the original design of these decks as being conforming um, and the issue necessitating their replacement being one of safety but resulting in a deck situation that doesn't conform. Um, I've heard discussion around parity uh, and maintaining parity amongst the condo association but I struggle with that in that each one of these buildings is unique. It is in its own location and its location, yes, is affected um, by property lines and that's why we're, we're here today. Um, I, I don't want to get caught up with standard number seven, um, but that's, that's where I'm, I'm at. I, I, I agree that standards one through six are, are met, um, but, um, Question standard number seven for, for what it is. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Are there any other comments by any of the board members? If not, uh, for the record, I, I intend to support the motion. Um, I concur with the findings of staff and Ms. Zyker, as well as Mr. Ayers, um, with respect to um, standard number, um, bear with me a second, Mr. Ron, the uh, um, standard number seven, the, this being minimum, um, I, I uh, I do. I don't find that these decks are overly obtrusive. The the size of them, um, as designed, uh, I do understand the the um, financial obligations of all the units. Um, but as far as the minimum, I I appreciate Mr. Potter's adding standard number eight to his his submittal. I I find the layout of the development, um, um, the buildings have looked to. Um, maximize their location such that they don't impact um, the public, traveling public, or um, people that would be on 15th Avenue driving, um, and that they wouldn't be noticed. Uh, the, the, these decks wouldn't be noticed as as uh, a setback encroachment. So, for that reason, I. I can find that standard 
standard number seven is at least partially met. I intend to support the motion. Um, yes, Ms. Dole. Um, I also intend to support the motion um, for the same reasons have been stated, but I wanted to comment on standard seven um, in with because there's, you know, the issue goes to whether it's the minimum variance that will make possible a reasonable use of the land and there's, you know, the, conceivably something in between, you know, 28 square feet and an additional 52 square feet. But the way I understood it, um, the reason for extending that far was to, had to do with issues from keeping away from the entry and everything from snow clearance so that there wasn't ice buildup um, and that, that that's why it, that was part of the reason why it extended, it had to extend that far out. Thank you, Ms. Dole. Are there any other comments from board members? If not, please vote. That motion passes by a vote of seven to zero. Again, I must read for the record, every final decision of the board shall clearly state on its face it is a final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the Superior Court. That brings us to our last case of this evening, case number 2015-0091. The applicant is Mark Ha. Is the applicant here this evening? He's indicated he's present. Could uh, staff provide us with the sufficiency of notice, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. On September 17th, 93 public hearing notices were mailed. Seven Responses were received, three in favor of granting the variance and four opposed. No comments were received from the Turning In Community Council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitlock. Would you proceed with your presentation? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The petitioner is uh, requesting a variance from AMC 2140-030-I maximum height of a structure to allow a residence to exceed the maximum height allowed for structures um, in the zoning district by nine inches. Uh, for sloping properties such as this one, as long as the difference in elevation along this slope is not more than 10 feet, the height of the structure is measured from the highest ground plane, which is in this particular case uh, the rear elevation uh, to the midpoint of the roof. Um, in your staff packet on page three, you can see a diagram um, showing the, uh, the way in which uh, the height of the structure is measured. The building plan submitted for the building permit show a proposed roof height of 25 feet as scaled from the rear elevation um, of the elevation drawings. The as-built provided by the petitioner shows the structure is built to a height of 30 feet 9 inches. Uh, the maximum height of the structure in the R1A district is 30 feet. I'd like to go through the seven standards uh, individually. Standard number one, staff finds that this standard is not met. Um, there are no uh, exceptional physical circumstances of the, the land that warrant the granting of this variance. The lot is, again, not affected by slopes, streams, or wetlands. The lot is served by public water and sewer. The topographical layout, size, and shape of the lot is similar to other uh, lots in the neighborhood. Standard number two, Staff finds that this standard is not met. There are no physical circumstances of the land contributing to the need for this variance. Uh, the petitioner's narrative notes that uh, backfill has been completed to bring the height, of, height into compliance, but since there is no survey data to specifically ascertain the pre-excavation height of the natural ground, the current level is not considered to be in compliance. 
Uh, the petitioner is not deprived of the rights commonly enjoyed by other property owners in the same district. The owner is, uh, is building a single family residential dwelling on the subject property, which is considered a permitted use in the district. Um, standard number three, staff finds this standard is not met. This standard speaks to the peculiarity of the lot and uh, that must arise out of some natural or physical condition of the, uh, of the lot and um, whether the need for the variance, uh, uh, variance is the, uh, it was beyond the control of the petitioner. There is no natural or physical uh, peculiarity of this lot. The lot had a gentle slope which should have been accommodated um, for through the design and construction process. The need for this variance is a result of an error made when surveying the location and construction of the home. Uh, the need for this variance appears to be self-imposed. Standard number four, uh, staff finds that this standard is substantially met. Given the character of the neighborhood, exceeding the maximum height allowed by nine inches will not likely adver adversely impact adjacent property. Standard number five, staff finds that this standard is met. The requested variance for the maximum height of the structure would not change the character of the zoning district. Um, the R1A district is intended as an urban and suburban single family residential area with low population densities. If the variance were granted, it would not allow a use not per permitted in the district. Standard number six, staff finds that this standard is met. No adverse effects are anticipated if this variance is uh, approved. Standard number seven, uh, staff finds that this standard is not met. Reasonable use of the land is not prevented by meeting the 30 foot height requirement. Um, the division finds that the standards one, two, three, and seven are not substantially met and therefore must uh, recommend denial of this variance. If the board finds that all seven standards are substantially met, um, then the approval should be subject to the three conditions listed on page six of your staff packet. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Are there any questions of staff by the board? Yes, Ms. Dole. Uh, I just had a question under standard 3A as to the building. It's where it states the building plan review was exempted from municipal review. Was and the and I also uh, I guess I wanted to ask the reason for that um, through the chair. Uh, through the chair, Ms. Dole, uh, this uh, building permit was reviewed by a third party reviewer uh, for single and two family uh, structures within the municipality. Uh, the property owner has the option of having uh, the municipal um, building department review their plans or a thir third party reviewer. In this particular case, uh, the property owner has opted to have a third party reviewer uh, review that design and stamp it. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Yes, Ms. McKay. Through the chair, um, looking on page 25 at uh, drawing of the of the home. So we're we're just talking about the the tallest part of the roof. There there are various different roof levels to this structure. Yes, we're actually we're talking about the the tallest. Um, portion of the roof, but not necessarily the peak, but the midpoint of that roof. But if the peak came down, then the midpoint would lower as well. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? And uh, I, I do have a couple questions. Mr. Whitlock, um, I know in past um, cases before us, there are certain things that have been the, the department or uh, building safety has had um, administrative um, authority to exceed a, a certain standard. I don't know if it's height or I don't remember exactly which, which ones they were. Um, 
that obviously isn't, this isn't one of those situations. I'm assuming otherwise it wouldn't be before us. Mr. Chair, uh, you're correct. Yes, in some certain, uh, in cer some circumstances, uh, the department has the ability to grant an administrative variance um, for, for very minor dimensional encroachments. Um, this one is outside um, uh, of, of that ability, and therefore, it's before the board tonight. Thank you. And then, then my second question: um, What? Uh, I don't know that I've seen. Uh, you know, maybe one of the board members can enlighten me, but I've not seen on an as built typically the height being as much of an issue um, how did this come to come to be an issue that that brought it before us this evening uh, through the chair uh, um, forgive me I didn't write this case and I, I don't know all of the uh, the history but um, I believe it was um, uh, discovered by one of the inspectors on the property um, and uh, the inspector notified uh, the property owner. The property owner ordered a new as-built. It was then reviewed by uh, the zoning department, and they determined that uh, uh, the structure was, in fact, over height. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Are there any other questions of staff by the board? Seeing none, could the applicant come forward, please? And could you please state and spell your name for the record? Yes, it's Mark Ha, M-A-R-K, last name H-A. Thank you, Mr. Ha. You have 10 minutes for your presentation. And just to reiterate, we must find that all seven standards are met, so if you'll Make sure your presentation addresses those seven standards at a minimum. Yes. Um, basically, the, um, there was a question that was made, how did this come in front of this board? <clears throat> there was a complaint from one of the, my neighbors or someone from the neighborhood. So we went and we measured uh, uh, the roof and determined that uh, it was, in fact, over height, nine inches. The way it came about is that, uh, and I tried to, I guess I'm not a very good writer. I'm not a, an attorney or an architect or anything, just a regular guy. But um, when we went to uh, build this house, um, there was a requirement because of its seismic area near the earthquake zone that um, uh, the foundation be over dug minimum seven feet. So. There's a lot of things that need to be done that was uh, not normally done in a regular house where uh, there was about, well, between five to 15 feet of uh, dirt that had to be dug out of the hole that was between seven and 10 feet beyond the footprint of the house, which meant uh, over 200 dump truck loads of dirt had to be removed from the lot. And uh, we had to have special fabric and gravel and all these things uh, 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 brought back and so it's, it's seismically stable and meets the code. In doing so, um, a lot of the natural um, slope of the area where the house was going in was removed. Um, so when we were uh, putting the foundation uh, uh, in, uh, there was a huge difference between the center of the the back of the center of the house and the left side, which would be the, on the south side. And because of the big slope change um, and, and because we were significantly under the roof height requirement, I didn't even think that would be an issue. We basically mellowed the slope uh, side to side, which resulted in lowering the natural grade of the back yard in the middle of the, uh, the house by several feet. So um, that's how it became. It's exactly the same house that was uh, permitted. It's exactly the same house that was drawn. The only difference is that I didn't put some of the dirt back in the back, uh, uh, back of the house. Um, when they came in and there was a complaint and they measured, uh, it was indeed found to be nine inches. 
I offered to them that, well, I'll put a foot more back and that's not a big deal. And um, uh, the reply that I got was that uh, the code requires you to be at uh, natural grade, and we figure natural grade to be exactly where the grade is now, uh, which was an arbitrary level that I just kind of arrived at. So um, I, I, did, uh, I did put some of the dirt back, and, 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 and it is under 30 feet now, but uh, I'm, I'm here today because, well, uh, they won't count that. In terms of, and I'm, I'm sort of in a roundabout way, uh, describing this to you because when you look at uh, number one, where they're talking about the, the there exists uh, exceptional or extraordinary physical circumstances of the subject property such as, but not limited to stream, wetlands, or slope and such. Um, this slope does have an effect here and it's front to back as well as side to left to right. And that's, you know, the house didn't grow, the slope went down because I just wanted a, 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 a less slopey backyard. Um, number two, because of these physical circumstances, a strict, let me see, uh, would, uh, application of this code would create an exceptional or undue hardship upon the property owner and would deprive the applicant of the right to commonly enjoy by the properties. Um, really, the difference of nine inches, I have a photo of the house here, but basically, um, the difference of nine inches is one and a half lap sidings, which is six inches per lap. Um, there was a, uh, a comment made by the other gentleman that said, if you could drive by the house, a lay person just driving by looking at the house or the neighborhood and find that something's not uh, out of step or something, uh, I would say that even if you were to come in with sensitive instruments and measure the house by professionals, you wouldn't notice a difference before and after you move nine inches off the very top because the uh, area affected would be literally 24 to 30 inches wide and about that much. Um, so I believe that that has uh, been met. And then we skip over to uh, number seven. The variance granted is the minimum variance that will make possible a reasonable use of the land uh, they say the standard not met, the reason we use the land is not prevented by meeting the 30-foot height limit. Uh, again, it's sort of an ar artificial limit that was um, the result of not putting the dirt back that was taken out. And I've since put the dirt back. And to spend several thousand dollars re-engineering and uh, uh, doing a change order with the city and going through the whole process to remove the very minimal amount that nobody would ever even notice is, is not reasonable. And that I consider that to be an undue hardship. So I feel that uh, item number seven has been met. Um, you know, I want to say that in closing, uh, you know, I, grew, I went to West High in the late 70s. It's sort of my old stomping grounds, as it were. I'm really happy to be moving over there. Um, and when we were really fortunate enough to get the lot and to build there, we, I designed it so that we could be stuck sort of left and back and really not block anybody's views that we, we could, uh, uh, if we could help it. Uh, we uh, took more than minimal care to make sure that it was a, a good house that, was, that would fit the neighborhood and that wouldn't, uh, uh, bother the neighbors very much, but um, anyways, I, I urge you to reconsider uh, and approve this variance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Are there questions of the applicant by the board? Yes, Mr. Ron. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Mr. Ha, I, I read in the staff packet uh, community comments uh, describing the neighborhood as historic. 
I, I, I'm not asking you to um, verify that actual nomenclature of a historic neighborhood, but can you give the board a little more context about um, the recent history of this neighborhood? It, it looks like from some of the, the photos in the staff packet that there's new development, um, but also reference to an older neighborhood as well. So is it, it mixed of sorts? Can you, can you describe Pete's Place? Is that a new addition to the neighborhood? What, what's happened recently here? Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, since I went to the high school in the 70s, uh, I'm privy to some of the stuff that's been happening. Um, uh, in the 70s, when I was going to West High, we used to have senior egg fights over there in the big gravel pit. Now it's, uh, uh, it's a park. Um, you've got the coastal trail that brings a lot of people, lots of uh, records and activities. And recently, fairly recently, there's been some um, uh, new homes that's been placed in there. And um, the homes that are placed in there that are closer to the water are fairly large in size. And I think uh, some of that is because of the cost of the lot. Um, they say the rule of thumb is 25% uh, to 30%, the cost of the lot should be the value of the house. So um, if you have a $200,000 lot, you should build an $800,000 house. And because the lots in that area are fairly expensive, uh, the homes tend to get bigger and more custom because you have to build to the value. So I think what you find in that neighborhood that's real special is that you've got uh, the newer homes that are fairly large and, and very well done, as well as older homes that have been newly renovated that look very modern and, and, and very contemporary. It's sort of a mixed bag, and uh, I like it. Thank you. Are there other questions of the applicant? Um, I do have a question. I'm still having a hard time, Mr. Haw, understanding how um, the over excavating of the material um, comes into play with respect to this variance and the height. Um, the, um, how does the, that? Yeah, um, the over excavating basically removed all of the natural terrain that existed before excavation, meaning that that big knoll that was right there, well, if you excavate 12 feet beyond that knoll, the knoll no, no longer exists. So um, when you dig a very large hole for a fairly smaller house, um, the natural terrain that tends to be there in, in regular uh, normal construction would be erased with that large overdig. Okay. Um, I'm looking on page well, of your your application. Um, it's a preliminary plot plan by VEI. It's an unsigned um, unsigned drawing, but there's some topo lines on it, um, and I don't see a knoll on on that plot plan. Yes, sir. The topo lines on these both that plot plan as well as uh, the other signed plot plan, which is Gestaldi surveying, uh, are not accurate. In fact, uh, you'll see that uh, on Gestaldi's plan, there's about a 10-foot change right to left on the elevation height that's listed here. The, uh, the topo that I'm referring to would be right uh, behind the house, um, well, and then the back side of the house that would be there, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not there. Right now, it's, um, it's buried six feet in the back um, instead of eight feet, and um, it's relatively flat. Um, there's another picture on, um, and again, these aren't numbered, um, but on the applicant, on the north, the photo in, in the application, 2308 Pete's Place North Elevation, 
facing south or facing north? No, the, it says the uh, tw 2308 Pete's Place north elevation. And there's a white right-way roofing van in the picture. Yes, sir. So where could you describe on that photo where the knoll was again? It would be right at the, where the dirt meets the house on the right side. Um, okay, so it, it looks like the dirt's been raised up about three or four feet from the, I guess, let's see if this is the north elevation. It would be on the right side of that photo by the that back Yes, fence. yes. That was the natural location of the knoll. It was just reduced in size because I wanted to be able to mow around the house. Okay. Well, it's it's a, a little uh, um, difficult for me when we have a, a stamp plot plan and then uh, even a preliminary plot plan, but you're indicating that neither one of those are correct. Um, uh, not on the to topo that? side. The official stamp plot plan is the one that uh, is not VEI, but um, uh, the one from Gestaldi surveying. And is, is that the, one correct? The topo is not correct. That is the one that shows 90 foot on the right side and 100 foot on the left, a 10 foot change. I see 100 feet on the southwest corner, 90 feet on the northwest corner. Is that yeah. what you're referring to? Yes, sir. But in fact, the southwest corner is the lowest point of the lot. The middle of the lot is the highest point. So if anything, it would be, if I was to venture a number, it would probably be going from right to left. It would probably 90, uh, 98, and then probably 89 on the left side, which is contrary to what the plot plan says. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ayers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Ha, it would be a lot easier for us to review this if we actually knew what the elevation of the ground is at the rear of the house now in relationship to the house. None of that information has been provided. I don't see any information that's provided on how the height determination was made to begin with. Um, you're, you stated earlier that you have returned the grade to where the house is now less than 30 feet. Do you have information to support that? Uh, yes, sir. We, uh, the, the house was nine inches over and we added two feet uh, to the grade. so it would give you a, a, a net uh, decrease of, of, of that much. We would be under by, um, would that be 24 minus nine? So it would be by 15, uh, 15 inches we would be under by, if you were to count that, uh, uh, that grade. Uh, the chair, Mr. Ha, what I was looking for is actually information submitted by a surveyor that would verify that the elevation and the height of the house actually meets code now. Thank you, Mr. I, Air, and, that, and that's what I'm wrestling with as well. Um, won't speak for um, for, for Mr. Air, but we have, there's contradictory information that's been given to us in our packet versus that that was in your application, Mr. Ha, that um, is different than what you're you're saying is actually the case out there. And I um, I know there we're still in the presentation, but I'd actually maybe suggest we discuss uh, letting the petitioner go back, get additional information to provide to us, or if you'd rather us hear this case this evening, we can do that as well. But um, I'm just trying to figure out, there's obviously people here this night, this evening. Um, 
that may want to um, make their testimony. But you understand what um, what my concern is, Mr. Ha. That, that I don't I don't understand what um, you say is contradictory. Um. Yes. Well, my comment is that the ASBEL shows that, or the plot, I guess we don't have an ASBEL showing what that lot elevation is. No. We, we have something that says it's 100 feet, and you're saying it's 10 feet lower on the southwest corner. I'm just uh, making a statement that the plot plan that, is, uh, that was submitted from the, uh, the certified surveyor is incorrect in terms of the elevation of the lot itself because this will this describes a lot being 10 foot higher on the left side than the right but as I uh, described to you the actuality the house is built the highest point of the lot is the middle of the house and it's lower on both sides and in terms of why I don't have a surveyor that has measured the height of the house right now as rehabilitated is because the city has completely dismissed the idea of actually being able to count that. So for me to have a, an official surveyor you know, spend money and do an official document, which I'd gladly do, um, it would have been a moot point because they weren't going to allow it uh, at the city level. Now, how do I know it's less than what it was? It was because, well, we measured it at 30 foot 9 inches, and two feet was added up, so it couldn't be anything but lower. Okay, um, Ms. Dole. Um, through the chair, Mr. Hyde, I, I, my question is, what, why not, um, I guess, why, if this plot plan is incorrect, is that because, I mean, do you, what, what is your belief? Was it that the surveyor erred or just why, what's the reason? Why, um, do you think they made an error in measurement or they just didn't look at the middle or what's the reason that you have? I believe that the surveyor made the error, but that uh, the information that was given to the city was probably what the city, all that the city required. Uh, they don't have a specific uh, uh, elevation requirement that I know of for each point in the, in the lot, a, a topo. The other thing also is that there's uh, uh, data that suggests what the elevation uh, levels are in any given lot in that area, but because of the earthquake, a lot has changed. Okay, so you think maybe the surveyor relied on old data that had changed because because there's been changes in the elevation due to settling or earth seismic activity or uh, y yes ma'am uh, in fact uh, when we went to dig for the foundation we found almost another house down there I mean there's a lot of debris down there so uh, my understanding was that uh, after the earthquake they came in and they dumped a bunch of material and just bulldoze over everything. Okay. M Mr. Ayers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do notice in the, it's not in the packet, it was in the uh, copy provided to us in our pouch, the copy of the survey from VEI actually has a very faint elevation line that runs through the back of the house and I believe it's 56 feet so that would indicate a higher elevation right at the back of the house but only about a foot higher than the remainder of the majority of the lot I'm not sure if you can see that in on any of your other copies the, there, there is a there's a faint line there but uh, uh, neither one are accurate to a point where you would say, okay, that's what the elevation is. And through the chair, Mr. Ha, then my question is, if, if the existing grade of the back of the house was 56 feet and you're allowed to build up to 86 feet with the top of your house, what is the height 
of the ground in relationship to the existing ground that was there and the height, the height of the house now, the height of the roof. That would be That would be 28 foot 7 inches, would be the actual net. And through the chair, Mr. Hot, and that's all uh, fine, but we have to have that information supported by some kind of evidence other than your testimony, I believe. Well, that's all I can, uh, that's all I can give you at this time. Um, so, okay, we have, uh, there, there's a couple options here. Um, one is we can request a postponement at this point for the petitioner to research that information. Um, if you don't feel that that information is available, we can act on what what's before us this evening. You, you understand? Which, 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 the actual height right now. Is that what you're asking? I don't uh, exactly understand what you're asking for. If it's, uh, if it's the height of the home with the dirt uh, rehabilitated to where it is now, I can certainly have a uh, professionals come and measure it. You've indicated that the height has changed over what was there original, originally. The, there was a knoll that's been removed. Yes. And that you've now replaced that knoll. That you, I don't want to speak for you, but I understand that you, you feel that that knoll should be used in computing the height of the house. Is that, is that a correct statement or no? Yes, either that or I would like a variance for the nine inches so that I could move in on Thanksgiving as I'm planning. Okay. Um, and the comments that have been made by, um, well, by myself and uh, I believe Mr. Ayers is, is that it would be helpful to have that information, go back and do some research on the topo. I believe there's also discussion on an actual survey of what's out there now of the property corners um, and the building height. M Mr. Whitfield, did you have a, a comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, uh, to point out um, Mr. Ha had made a statement earlier about the municipality not accepting um, uh, additional fill being brought in to comply with the height limitations, and I, I just wanted to point out to the board that that historically has been the case that uh, you cannot bring in additional fill to, uh, to, to meet the height, you know, limitation. Uh, I know the board is considering or would like to know exactly how much fill uh, has been brought in and, and what the elevation would be uh, with that additional fill, but historically the municipality has not accepted that uh, as, as a way to comply with uh, the height regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. Um, I, I would like to say that, uh, you know, that makes it sound like I'm bringing Phil in <laughs> um, to artificially raise uh, the ground, but the fact is, is that I've taken 200 dump truck loads of dirt out. I'm just putting back the stuff that came out of there. So, I mean, I'd like to, you know, have you guys consider that. Thank you. Ms. Eicher. I was actually just about to withdraw my request to speak. That was a, a clarification that I had wanted. I thought I had heard your testimony that you extracted 200 dump trucks of dirt. And I don't build houses for a living, but I assume that you extract more than you need to put your foundation in and then you backfill, so to speak. So perhaps um, through the chair, the staff could address that question. Is, is that considered backfilling to the point that the municipality wouldn't, con, wouldn't um, see the replacement of dirt after the foundation's been established as a valid me measurement or? Uh, 
Uh, through the chair, uh, Ms. Eicher, that's a, a good question. Um, and I, I guess it kind of revolves around the intent. Um, and is the intent to, to backfill the foundation or is the intent to, um, to, to raise the level of, uh, of the, the grade of the property to comply with the, the height limitations? And, you know, I would say that if somebody was simply backfilling the foundation um, and then that complied with the height limitations, well, then I think that would probably be acceptable. However, um, based off of what I know of the situation, um, Mr. Ha is proposing to, to, to backfill and raise the, uh, the, the actual grade of the property additionally to comply with the, uh, with the, uh, the height limitations as a, a, uh, a way to comply with that, that code. So um, historically, we do not accept that, no. Mr. Ron. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, question for perhaps all parties, um, starting with staff. Um, on page two of st the staff packet, there's description as to the datum and, and how and where the measurements are made with respect to scenarios that have a difference in elevation along the slope, uh, not more than 10 feet. Um, are we close to that threshold in, in looking at page 14 of the staff packet and the as build understand there's some concern over accuracy, but I see relative differences, and unless I'm completely incorrect here, along the slope um, of 10 feet, 100 to 90 and 99 to 89. So my question is, um, what if the elevation along the slope is more than 10 feet? Would, would that have any bearing or, or change um, the data or point of reference for the house height measurement? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Ron, you're correct. Yes, if the, uh, the height difference is more than 10 feet, then that changes where the measurement is made. Um, in this particular case, um, uh, I believe the staff person that wrote this case determined that it was less than 10 feet. Um, and, and thus, the, uh, the measurement was taking, taken at the highest uh, plane uh, to the midpoint of the highest roof. So if it was more, it would be taken from the bottom of the plane, um, uh, the lowest plane to the midpoint of the roof. Thank you. Ms. Dole. Um, Mr. Ha, I was wondering if you had any before pictures. Bef uh, there's actually a couple in here. I, I saw showing an older st uh, structure, I think. Uh, but I was wondering if uh, you had any that showed the landscaping and the knoll that you've been talking about. The, uh, the only photo I have is where it shows it being excavated, which is it shows the excavator and uh, roller inside. If you look to the right side of it, you see a significant uh, cut, which goes more and more higher as it goes to the right. Uh, that's the area that I was speaking of. However, this is uh, about 10 feet away from the actual corner of the house because it's, it's the, um, the foundation. The, this one right here? Do, I'm not sure. Was it with your application? It, it should have been the last photo. I believe that's, he's referring to page 24 of the staff packet. Oh, thank you. Are there other questions of uh, the petitioner? Just, just to follow up? Yes, Ms. Dole. Would, would you have other photos that are not in this packet that would, from before the dump trucks that would show the elevations? or landscape or anything? No, ma'am, not, um, not, nothing that would show the elevation. Okay. 
Just simply, there's, there's, I think some on Google Maps or whatever, Street View, but it's got all this brush, you can't really tell what's there. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ha, one other question. So if this board weren't to grant the variance, how would you address what would be needed to address the, um, the height issue? I'm sorry, sir. I... If the, if this board weren't to grant a variance, what what's the how would you address that? I mean, what would have to be done to lower the roof would have to be cut. Um, if you see the photo, I've deliberately not finished 36 inches of the top of the the very peak of the uh, of the roof, and the unfinished portion you see. Uh, a small percentage of that would have to basically it would be about this much off the top it's not really the work the work is from my construction guys what they're saying is basically um, four or five hours worth of work but we're talking about a lot of money and engineering and uh, change order with the city and all these other things that have to be uh, put into place Okay, so with the, you'd like us, just for clarification, you'd like us to proceed with your testimony this evening and the information that's been submitted in your application for us this evening? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Are there, uh, Mr. Ron? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the question you just asked and Mr. Hall's response. I um, may have misheard uh, Ms. McKay's question of staff earlier uh, regarding potential remedy. Um, is it not correct that if the eaves were dropped 18 inches, that would change the point of me measurement and could also be a, a remedy to meet the height requirement in, in a different fashion? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Ron, are you suggesting that the eaves of the roof be brought down 18 inches? Yes. Or are you suggesting that additional fill be brought in to raise the level of the, the measuring plane? Just the eaves themselves. If the eaves were brought down, then then correct. Um, the being as though the measurement is taken from midpoint of the roof, one would um, uh, guess that that certainly the the height of the structure would be brought down as well. Thank you. I guess a follow-up question to that to Mr. Ha, um, is that something that you would entertain as a potential remedy? Anything that doesn't require engineering, I think, would be uh, entertained. Um, when you say Eve, are you talking about, I'm sorry, English is my second language. What is the Eve? Perhaps another board member can explain, but my understanding is the lowest portion of the roof line. The lowest or portion, pro not the profile. highest portion. When I asked the question, I was asking about the peak of the roof. If the peak of the roof came down, then the, the midpoint of the roof moves down as well. I suppose it would be a lot easier to lower the eaves, <laughs> the tails, um, but I never thought of that. I'm, I'm looking at page, going back to the figure on page three again. Um, Mr. Mr. Whitlock, I'm sorry, Whitfield. The, uh, um, the height of building, again, is calculated from the, what part of the roof or the top of the house are we talking about? And and maybe with that in mind, specific to the actual elevation plan that we've been provided. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if I may direct you to uh, page three of your staff packet, um, there are two diagrams there. Um, case number one is the, uh, the situation that we have uh, here tonight. Um, the height of the structure is, is actually measured uh, from the highest plane five feet out from the 
exterior wall of the structure to the midpoint of the highest um, roof. So, um, so you can you can see. I'm sorry. It's actually. I'm, I apologize. It's actually measured from the. Um, No, that is correct. It's measured from the highest plane five feet out to the midpoint of the roof. That's correct. The way that the, the city measures uh, the height of structures, I have to tell you, is, is somewhat uh, difficult to understand. Um, and, uh, and it's not an exact science by any means. Um, but that is what we have, that's what it, what's in our code, and that's what we have to adhere to, so. Thank you, are there any other questions of staff? I mean, are there any other questions of Mr. Hall? Thank you, if not, the um, Public hearing is open. Is there anyone from the public wishing to testify? If you will please come forward, uh, state and spell your name for the record. Hi, my name is Lisa Paisani. It's Lisa, L-I-S-A, P is in Patrick, A-E-S-A-N-I. And Ms. Paisani, you have three minutes for okay. your presentation, for um, your testimony. Thank you for being here. I appreciate having a voice and being able to have a panel to talk to about this kind of thing, just to educate myself, too, as far as how the law goes. Um, I'm one of his neighbors, Mr. Ha's neighbors, and he's very nice, and it's a beautiful house. Um, and it doesn't get in the way of our view. And I might have a picture that shows the house by him being built. There's a back fence that shows the original height because the fence was dividing his property and the other property. If you look at the fence, you can see the high point of the property. So if you want to do that, you could. Um, my issue with this, um, like I said, it's not blocking our view. It's when we bought our house, we bought our house when the, the land, the city okayed it to be redeveloped and the people wanted to move out and none of us wanted anyone to build in here in this earthquake zone. But we came and bought this house and the two lots across from us are tiny. And they told us, the city told us, no houses would ever be able to be built there because the lots are so small. One of these houses Mr. Ha has and has built a huge house. Um, it's beautiful, but it's really huge for the lot size and I don't know how that happened, but that did. That may have been a meeting I missed. Um, so it seems like it's playing with numbers. It's playing with like lowering the roof down a lot and bringing in soil to make the size. It's just it's, it's like lying with statistics, with the games that our builders do to build these huge houses. And a lot of the neighbors are having a hard time with it. I have um, a whole statement from somebody else on my phone who couldn't come. I don't know if I can read that too from Pat Kelly. It's somebody else. Um, anyway, what I'm worried about is setting up a precedence in this neighborhood because a lot of houses are going to be built. And, you know, it's, we just need to follow the law. I'm, and that's why I'm glad this board is here. We need people to follow the law. And it, it is a beautiful house and I would hate to have him go through a lot of expense but you, you just can't start doing that. You can't let people just do whatever the hell they want because there's a law for a reason. And so that's, that's my whole thing is I, I don't, it's a pretty house and he's a nice man. It's nothing personal, but we can't set a precedent of people just breaking the law. That's, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Pasani. Are there any questions? It, there were no questions, but in the future, anyone, when they do testify, would you wait in case we do have questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else wishing to testify? Could you state and spell your name for the record? 
my name is Dawn, D-A-W-N, Moreau, M-O-R-E-A-U. Yes, Ms. Moreau. Yes, I think Mr. Ha's house is beautiful. I think if you take nine inches off the top of it, it will look awful. You will walk by it and you will say, well, what's wrong with that house? I think lowering the eaves would be perfect. I have been through the building safety department. It is an onerous, onerous thing to go through. He went through it, he got zoning, he has minimum setbacks. He went through the law, he had his as built he had his plans there, and to have him go through this, I think is just awful, just awful. And if you make him take nine inches off the top, I will just be upset. Thank you, Ms. Moreau. Um, and a couple of questions. Do you live um, in, the, in the neighborhood? I do. I uh, live, well, a few blocks away, but I go by his house because I'm a regular user of the Coastal Trail. Okay. And I think he would just be a wonderful addition to our neighborhood. And to do this to a wonderful neighbor is just unneighborly. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Ms. Moreau? Thank you. Could you state and spell your name for the record? Yeah, good evening. My name is Nicholas Van Wyck, N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S. And I do live in the neighborhood. I live- Could you spell your last name too? V-A-N-W-Y-C-K. Thank you, Mr. Van Wyke. Yes. You have three minutes. I uh, live in a neighborhood. I live two lots away from this building. And I can actually see into his top floor over the top of my neighbor's house, which I could not see beforehand. That is to say, he can see into my house from his house over the top of my neighbor. Um, now we've heard a little earlier um, about how this came about, <clears throat> and I think that one's level of skepticism should be very, uh, should be raised. Basically the problem as has been presented to us is the builder has dug too big a hole, he's built his house, and it's still too large. We've heard from other people here, but it's a very nice house, but it's a very big house on a very small lot. But I keep asking you to come back to how is it you dig 200 lots, uh, 200 loads of material out of a site, build your house, and it still ends up being too big. The house is too large. It's too large for the zoning and uh, the rules of the municipality, uh, especially uh, Title 21, say that there weren't going to be additional variances. There's going to be a basic set of rules that everyone was going to have to follow. Now it's true that this area has just come up for development and there will be many, many more houses built in this area. Uh, there are three or four houses that have just been built, very, very tasteful houses that fit its way right across from uh, the petitioner. Uh, this house stands out as being far, far larger. But there will be more houses and it is important that you set a precedent. And contrary to my neighbor who just testified, uh, I do not believe it is unneighborly to require people to follow the law and to keep a level of aesthetic in, in uh, level with the rest of the, uh, of the neighborhood. Um, and I must say, I'm a little bit confused about why there is question for petition of a variance. If the builder removes the uh, the eight inches that are, or nine inches that are too high, presumably he wouldn't need a variance. He would be under the size of requirements for the house lot. And objectionable as it may be, we wouldn't be here. The reason we're here, he's asking to have his house, his very large house, exist as it is with basically a dispensation, a waiver from you for doing the wrong thing.
there's a suggestion that uh, there will be no hardship involved in this. Well, this morning I heard uh, the tack, tack, tack of, uh, of nail guns going on. The owner is building ahead, full speed. Uh, so clearly any hardship is self-inflicted. Thank you, Mr. Van White. Any Are there questions? Any Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify? Yeah, hello, I'm Luca Ellenbrook, and I live in the old part of Turnagain. Could you, again, oh, state, oh, spell your name for the record. Yeah, my name is Luca, L-O-U-K-E, last name Ellenbrook, E-L-L-E-N-B-R-O-E-K. Yes, Ms. Ellenbrook. So, um, you have three as minutes. sorry. You have three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, as mentioned before, that um, during the earthquake, the soil, you know, went down, and my our house happens to be it, it was built before the earthquake. It's the last house that stood. So, right if you go down out of my driveway and the road is Mackenzie. It goes down. We have a small view, and that view will be obstructed by houses. I don't know if you ever went to the theater and you were behind this lady with this hairdo on her head. Well, if, you know, what I have basically. So if you take that down, that makes a big difference, whatever, nine inches or, or, or 25 inches, because we are behind it and that's our view. So all the houses that are gonna be built, as mentioned before, all the empty lots, if you get now already a house, oh, it doesn't matter, it's nine inches higher, or it's a little bit too big, or we don't know exactly how, you know, how the soil, how the level was before he or she built this house. Yeah, we think it's like that. No, 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 it's like that. So I think it's really good to look at that land, how it is now, and see how there's already some lots that are, there are people already done soil there. So I, I just hope that you figure out that there's all the people that live around there that, like us, that have a view now, or a little view, that, that will be even worse than if you get huge houses there that can do, you know, why is the law there so other people can have a view or other people know what will, how it will look in the future. So that's my only thing that I would like to ask you to do, is just look at the law and also how the soil is now before they all build their homes there. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of Ms. Ellenbrook? Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to testify? Again, can you state and spell your name for the record? Uh, my name is Arden Page. First name A-R-D-E-N, last name P-H-E-E. -E and I am a neighbor. I do not live on Marston. I live a couple streets over, but I am a heavy user of the Coastal Trail. And I have been a, I've been a heavy user of the coast before there was a Coastal Trail. And uh, some things that I, I wasn't planning on speaking to until sitting here tonight, but uh, Mr. Ha is telling matters of fact when he says that the south end of his lot was higher than the east, than the north end of his lot, because I rode a bicycle up that hill from the time that the Marston entrance was created and I could ride my bike to, to school. And to school, to work. Uh, and the bite of the hill was about where that lot is. It was, uh, it started a little bit before that and ended up beyond that. Uh, so the, the, the change in elevation between the north end and the south end was fairly significant. Uh, the second thing is that somebody had asked about the uh, prior use of the property and uh, what we're talking about here is the, the old Turnagain subdivision that went down during the 64 earthquake, a portion of it. And uh, 
the, the lots as drawn there are the lots that existed at the time of the 64 earthquake. It has been revitalized by the reconstruction of West Martinson Drive and the installation of, I believe, water and sewer to those lots. But the, the, uh, what brought me here tonight was what I thought I understood after reading the, the information that, that came around with the packet, and it was that the nine and a half inch uh, variance that was involved was not going to be able to be, be remedied by the installation of backfill. And I can tell you that the amount of excavation that was done for the foundation was incredible. You would have thought that a multi-story hotel was going up there, and then it was all backfilled after the cells were created by concrete walls. And to me, it is just a total absence of common sense when the gentleman from Title 21 announces that could, you can't Could you, um, excuse me, uh, you've hit your three minutes, and I, I didn't catch your last name again. Could you read? Page, P-A-G-E. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. It's the Page. death of common sense. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just for clarification, you support the, the granting of the variance, or? I do, yes. Are there other questions of Mr. Page by the board? And, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wishing to testify? Please state and spell your name for the record. Mark Sturry. It's spelled S-T-U-R-E. Yes, Mr. Sturry, you have three minutes. I'm uh, a neighbor of or I live in the neighborhood there where this house has been being constructed and uh, I've lived there for about 20 years I'd say. It is a problematic neighborhood that as someone recited fell down in the earthquake so it um, has been redeveloped. I understand the dilemma that you have in uh, the function that you do for the city and I can only say that I speak in support of Mr. Ha and uh, I would support a variance being issued in his favor. I don't think that uh, what he's built detracts visually, and while it may in a very small way have exceeded a limitation, I think that, um, I don't think he, he intended to deceive or uh, circumvent any of the regulations. And, um, I would hope you could find it in yourself to uh, <clears throat> grant his variance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sturry. Are there any comments or any questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Hart, uh, Mr. Sturry, I, I believe there was a question. It, I, I guess I would ask what uh, Mr. Sturry's comments are related to the last um, Mr. Page, w witnesses' comments related to. Actually, I knew I, I'm. Uh, I know of some of my neighbors who have spoken here, and I know pretty much where everyone lives there. Um, I don't know Mr. Ha very well. I've just met him in the neighborhood since he started building. It, it, maybe, maybe I could clarify a little bit more. Uh, the, the last witness. <clears throat> basically stated that the, the land isn't, Page. A, is, isn't as high as it uh, was prior to them excavating. What, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I don't have a uh, as clear a memory as 
Mr. Page has about that no. I, I, I would, if he testified to that, I would believe him. Um, but as Mr. Page testified, that was all upheaval ground there. I mean, it, it went through the earthquake, and uh, as Mr. Ha said, uh, you know, there were remnants of old foundations that were excavated out of that. And, and I also, <laughs> I do have some building experience, and uh, as Mr. Ha testified, there was many feet excavated and two layers of gravel followed by geotextile and gravel and geotextile just to get to the point where you can start pouring concrete. So um, I guess I'm not surprised that elevation slipped in all that earth moving and uh, the original fence that preceded his ownership of that lot is behind him and he cited, I don't know what pictures that he provided or that you are looking at, but that old fence was there and uh, has been there. Um, other than that, I, you know, I can't, uh, I'm sorry that Mr. <clears throat> ha doesn't have, you know, have any evidence to support this and I guess seeing, witnessing all this, it, uh, it underlines to me the importance of, I guess, having a uh, elevation survey done before you start. Thank you, Mr. Sturry. Did that answer your question, Mr. Hart? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the public? Um, I'm sorry, ma'am. It, it would have to be submitted as evidence, but we can't look at your phone for a picture. <laughs> Are there any other um, comments? Anyone else from the public wishing to testify? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Um, Page, but uh, your three minutes, you, you've used up your three minutes. Is there anyone else? Anyone else from the public? Seeing and hearing no one, the public hearing is closed. Uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me. Um, does staff have any rebuttal, Mr. Woodfield? Uh, no, Mr. Uh, Chair, no rebuttal. Thank you. Mr. Ha, you have uh, uh, just... Mr. Ha, you have two minutes and 48 seconds of your 10 minutes for rebuttal, if you'd care to rebut any of the comments made this evening. I, I, I would, and um, you know, I know it's, it's, a, it's a very special neighborhood and there's a lot of special people there, and I've got some neighbors that don't like what I'm doing and some that do and so on, and uh, it's, I'm happy to be in a neighborhood where people do care and I think that's, that's great. Um, I want to address one thing that uh, was mentioned by a few people, that it's a big house, and uh, it may be out of character for the old Turnigan homes that were there, the, <coughs> the houses from before the earthquake and so on. But, um, the, and I tried to address it a little bit from the dollars and cents standpoint in terms of what normally is billed for what values of the house being 25% um, of the value of the, the finished home. But the reality is, is that uh, my house looks very huge, but it's really not. It's 3,260 square foot of finished area, which is similarly sized to the one across the street, the two of them that uh, the gentleman mentioned, uh, all I guess probably all four houses in that area is similar style with 
uh, garage underneath the homes and a floor or two above it. Uh, my lot is just very shallow, so the house is wider, and I do a lot of hobby stuff, so my garage is big. Um, but um, uh, I would say that uh, if you were to look at the houses that are on the west side of my house, my house would be one of the smallest ones there. I would say that if you were to look back five years from now when all the other lots have been filled, the houses on the 100 yards to the uh, uh, east side of the house, my house would probably be one of the smallest because all the lots over there are $400,000 after you add the assessments. And there, they will be houses that are over a million and a half for all those lots individually. And uh, they're simply going to be big homes, and, you know, it's, that's the way the math has uh, worked out. Um, you know, I'm trying to build something that would be a benefit, that would look nice, and that would add to other people's home values. Uh, I want to be a good neighbor. And, um, you know, I just... Uh, certainly, I'm trying to do the right thing here, and uh, um, I'm asking you for a variance. And, um, and, and again, as I uh, uh, explained before, uh, this doesn't come off of when we're not trying to get away with anything. It's just simply turned out to be that way after the, uh, uh, the backyard was uh, leveled, and you know, that was probably my biggest mistake. But Thank, um, thank you, Mr. Haw. That's where we said. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, Questions? Just, just um, w w one question that I, I should have asked earlier. The, on the original plans, you had indicated that it was the same house as what you had submitted. It was shown as a 26-foot-high house in the, what you submitted. So is it just because of the over-excavation that you had to add? Add four feet of height, or oh, the, the four feet of height ended up from leveling the backyard. Okay, so it was the same building, exactly same building same. plan. Yes. Okay. The city wouldn't um, pass it if it wasn't. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. With that, the matter rests with the board. Uh, could I have a positive motion from a board member, please? Yes, Ms. McKay. Okay, I'm going to give it a try. I move that we grant a variance from AMC 2140-030-I, maximum height of a structure, to allow our residents to exceed the maximum height allowed for a structure by nine inches. Subject to the um, three conditions on page six. Thank you, Ms. McKay. Could we have a second to that motion, please? Yes, Mr. Hart, you've indicated you'd second that motion? Yes. Thank you. Uh, would you speak to your motion, please, Ms. McKay? Well, I intend to support the motion, and um, I will now go through the, the, the standards. Standard one, um, I do believe that there is an exceptional and extraordinary physical circumstance for this particular piece of property in that um, it is in the um, earthquake zone that it's in, and it was required to be heavily excavated to, um, to put in the foundation and um, backfilling from that heavy explanation, excavation. Um, you know, nine inches is just not that much. And that's where I am with that. Um, and then that carries forward into uh, condition number two. Um, because of these physical circumstances, the strict application of the code um, does create a, a hardship. Uh, I realize taking nine inches off the top of the roof or extending the, the, um, the eaves downward to make up these nine inches is not a huge thing, but, um, yeah. And then uh, standard number three, the hardship is not self-imposed. 
I don't believe that Mr. Ha specifically came out with the intent to, to deceive anyone um, and build his house nine inches higher than, than he was supposed to. Um, I don't think that, um, that, and that there are special conditions and circumstances that don't result from his actions as such. Uh, four and five, I agree with uh, staff that they are met or uh, substantially met as well as number six. And then number seven, um, I think that, that I've addressed with the, the fact that, um, that the house is there now and it, it's not going to go away. And we're, we're talking about taking nine inches off the top of the roof. And I, I think that granting the variance for nine inches does make um, possible uh, a reasonable use of the land. And that's what I have to say about that. Thank you, Ms. McKay. Um, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I concur with uh, Ms. McKay's findings, specifically as it relates to uh, number one, the slope of the house. It, I, I think it is something that is somewhat convincing to me as well. If you look at page 15 of the staff packet, you can see that near the rear of the house, there there is some slope. And the fact that they had um, so much excavation that had to occur, it, I think I agree that n number one is met as well. Um, I do intend to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Are there uh, other comments from board members? Any other comments? If not, Mr. Mr. Ron. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a, a general comment. We heard some public testimony around um, adherence to the law and would like to acknowledge uh, the petitioner's uh, diligence in his testimony, but also those who have testified from the public and recognize the opportunity that we have as a board to um, weigh the evidence that put, that's put before us and acknowledge the appreciation that I have as a board member for the, the civil um, discussion that, that, that was had and find that this process, as it's playing out before us, uh, is the law that we have to adhere to. So um, uh, that's a general comment. And with respect to the motion before us, um, I as well, for the reasons stated by fellow board members, intend to support it. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Are there other, um, any other comments from any of the board members? I, I actually, um, do intend to support the motion as well. I was concerned, as I've mentioned, about the uh, information. Uh, this is a very difficult case, as um, I'm sure people can understand, but um, we have heard, and just as, as Mr. Ron mentioned, um, everyone uh, comes in and, and we appreciate all their testimony, but have heard the uh, testimony that there, there were uh, topographic issues related to the lot. That was part of my concern. Also hearing from um, staff that the computation of building height is uh, um, a, a little bit of an estimation and that the solution, if, if in fact it were the nine inches, would be, it, w it wouldn't change the height of the garage elevation, it wouldn't ha change the height of the second story, it would change the pitch of the, the roof on the building. And um, yes, um, it would be holding, um, um, holding the petitioner to, to the standard of that height, but I don't see that um, that would make it a more aesthetically pleasing structure. I don't, I haven't heard any testimony that this isn't an aesthetically pleasing structure. Um, so I do also intend to support it based on the testimony of Mr. Mrs. McKay and Mr. Hart. Are there any other comments? If not, please vote.
That motion passes by a vote of seven to zero. Again, for the record, I must read, every final decision of the board shall clearly state on its face it is a final decision with respect to all issues involved in the case and that the parties have 30 days from the date of mailing or other distribution of the decision to file an appeal to the Superior Court. That was our last case of this evening um, regarding reports. I don't believe we have any cases in November, so there won't be a, a meeting in November. There won't be? There will not be a meeting in November. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Um, um, Will there be a, a, does anyone know what their plans are for December as far as, is that too far out? I hope it is. Uh, Ms. Eicher. Can I hold my comment until after you resolve that question? Yes, you can. Anyone know that, let's put it this way, anyone know that they'll be gone? Yes, Mr. Ron. Yes, Mr. Chair, I will be um, in a warmer climate the second Thursday in December okay. and, and wouldn't be able to attend a board meeting. Thank you. Um, I understand, Mr. Hart, is this, this your last, uh, is this your last um, meeting? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm... That, that, that's my understanding. Oh, okay. Um, so, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess it is your last meeting, but I, that's my understanding. I guess. The, the, the paperwork I have states that my term is up October fourteenth. So okay, if that's incorrect, somebody please let me know so I don't miss the next I meeting. I thought that paperwork got lost permanently. <laughs> <laughs> Mine hasn't been. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, if yeah. if it is, I'd like to thank you very much for being on the uh, um, the board and and your uh, your participation and testimony on all the difficult cases. I've always felt. This is probably the most difficult board um, to be a part of, and I, I've always respected all the um, positions and the intellect that sits here. It's not an easy um, board to be on, so thank you very much. And if it happens that you're back, that's even better news. <laughs> I appreciate everybody's patience with me. Uh, it, it's really great to see how well you guys do at, at this. Uh, it's definitely been tough for me coming from a business perspective and not having an engineering background or anything like that. So I, I do appreciate your uh, patience with me. Thank you. Ms. Eicher. Oh, I, my comments were along the same lines. I wanted to thank Mr. Hart for his time. It's been a pleasure to get to know him and serve on the board with him. We will miss you and always welcome you back. That's right. Um, are there any other comments from any of the board members? Um, if not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Yes, Ms. Dole, in a second. Could I have a second? Mo <laughs> okay. <Huh>? Anyway. <laughs> oh, everyone's locked Mr. Out. Hart's last action, would he like to? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, based, yeah, give it. Second. All right. Um, any objection? If not, we are adjourned. <laughs>